sorry. So the, you briefly saw my disclosures, and this is the outline of uh, what I'm, I'd like to discuss with you. That's the technique, the indications and contraindications for microwave ablation in the lung, side effects of that therapy, and I'd like to go uh, through a few cases with you. And my aim when putting together this presentation was for those of you who are maybe planning to set up a microwave ablation service uh, yourself to give you some idea how it works. And for those who don't and just uh, suggest that therapy for patients or follow up patients after microwave ablations to hint at some of the important aspects. So talking about technique first, this is my personal approach and I uh, use a CT fluoroscopic guidance, which is obviously not compulsory. You can do it with any CT guidance, but CT fluoroscopy makes it easier and more convenient. The technique of placing the probe is actually very, very simple to lung biopsy, which probably most of us do in focal lung lesions. Uh, the question which we usually have to decide during or sometimes in advance of the procedure is whether we uh, can work with a single uh, probe position, which is usually done in smaller lesions, or whether we need multiple positions, and that needs to be planned in advance. Then the actual ablation process, I think, is relatively easy, com particularly compared to a radiofrequency ablation in the lung, for example, which I did before I switched to a microwave. And I think radiofrequency ablation um, is more complicated. Uh, an important issue is track ablation. So when removing the probe, not just remove it, but heat the probe during um, the removal because it will uh, control hemorrhage and it will also avoid tumor cell seeding. This is the system which I use, and there are obviously other systems on the market, and what they have in common is that the probes are thicker than biopsy needles. Uh, they are all available in different sizes. With this system, it's 15, 20, and 30 centimeter probes, which uh, I think are appropriate for almost all purposes in the lung. Uh, we use a system with water cooling, but there are also systems available with no water cooling. This is something which I really like, that is that the manufacturer provides you with a chart or a software program uh, to predict the size of the necrosis which can be created using different um, energy levels and different times. I don't quite understand why the chart includes the ex vivo figures because all of us will do this in vivo uh, so we probably could, uh, could spare that. But otherwise, it's really nice to predict on a chart the size of the necrosis that you will create using a, a certain time and a certain energy. Easier than with microwave. Sorry, easier than with radiofrequency ablation. So this is what I pr uh, particularly prefer uh, about microwave, that, uh, is that you can really precisely predict the size of the ablation zone and it is not affected by uh, positioning of different probes in, in large uh, RFA antennas, for example. It's really very predictable. Uh, the second thing which I prefer in microwave uh, over RFA is the fact that the ablation times are usually shorter, and particularly when you need to reposition the probe um, once or twice or even uh, several times, that really uh, makes the procedure a much more uh, feasible in clinical routine because it, it blocks the C CT scanner for a shorter period of time. Uh, there is no heat sink effect uh, from blood vessels, which I think is a, a big advantage, rather not within the lung, but in the liver, for example. In the lung, the good news is that there is no insulation from aerated lung around a lesion, so it's, uh, it's reliably possible to achieve a safety margin which I found problematic with RFA because aerated lung would uh, provide cooling uh, at RFA, but it does not at microwave. One advantage is that you don't need a neutral electrode compared to a radiofrequency ablation. That may be an advantage in, in patients with pacemakers. And compared to another uh, interventional technique, um, um, irreversible electroporation, there is no muscular fibrillation, which is uh, good if you want to do it in conscious sedation. Uh, I think IRA would be difficult in conscious sedation. I do my interventions in general anesthesia, and also I think the anesthetists are quite happy that there is no muscular fibrillation induced. 
a key question when uh, uh, considering to perform microwave ablation in the lung is obviously a good indication. And the first issue which I'm putting up here is uh, the same for resection as well as for ablation. It, it needs to make sense in an oncological therapy concept. And usually, uh, either resection or ablation is only uh, useful for the patient when all metastases can be resected or can be ablated. Um, this, from my point of view, requires complete staging, so I will never ablate a patient in whom I don't have a whole body CT staging, at least to make sure that there are no extra pulmonary metastases which are not under control. There is some discussion whether incomplete destruction of tumor cells and metastatic disease may be uh, useful in combination with immunotherapy, uh, so presentation of antigens by either stereotactic radiation or maybe incomplete microwave ablation, uh, would that allow antigen presentation and um, make an immunotherapy more effective afterwards, but that's work in progress, I think. Uh, Ablation in general, I think, is inferior to a complete oncologic resection. So usually uh, we ablate only patients in whom surgery is not indicated, either because the loss of pulmonary parenchyma would be an inadequate, usually in centrally located lesions, or if surgery is uh, difficult or complicated because of previous surgery, because for us, during an ablation procedure, it's actually an advantage if there are uh, adhesions between the lung and the pleura. For a surgeon, it's the other way around. They hate pleural adhesions if they want to do pulmonary surgery. Um, another competitor is obviously stereotactic uh, radiation, gamma knife, cyber knife, this sort of very high focused radiation. But there are situations in which radiation therapy is not possible. The patient may have had previous irradiation to the same area of the chest. Uh, or there may simply be critical organs uh, very close to the lesion which uh, do not tolerate the necessary radiation dose. So overall, the decision to perform an ablation in the lung should be made by a multidisciplinary team, and this is how we do it. We discuss every individual case in our multidisciplinary team meetings. Very similarly in primary lung cancer, uh, ablation um, is only useful from my point of view when proper oncologic resection, lobectomy or um, sublobar um, oncologic resection, including lymphadenectomy, uh, is not feasible. Again, possibly due to an inadequate loss of parenchyma or again due to adhesions which may prevent a, a surgical approach. Also, in primary lung cancer, the big competitor is uh, stereotactic or cyber knife or gamma knife uh, radiation. So only in cases in which this is not indicated, uh, we would discuss uh, microwave ablation. And one contraindication for irradiation, which I did not list, is actually a very uncooperative patient. Because for radiation, it's really difficult if the patient doesn't comply. Uh, for um, f thermal ablation, I think it's easier, particularly if we do it in general anesthesia. And then there's a the question what to do with patients who are eligible for curative surgery but deny that uh, or deny radiation therapy. And uh, we try and persuade patients to undergo the best medical therapy, but if they still refuse, we may then turn to uh, thermal ablation in order to provide the second best option. And again, this decision is made in a multidisciplinary team in all the cases. Now the practical way, how do I do it? And I acknowledge that there are different ways of performing local ablations um, in, in different settings. Uh, as I said, we always start with a decision in an MDT meeting. We get informed consent, and this is both for the microwave ablation as well as for general anesthesia. Uh, anesthetist, um, uh, insist on and having a separate informed consent for GE, obviously. We block a two-hour time slot in our CT suite, which we usually don't use, but in case of complications, we want to be free before the next patient is scheduled to treat a complication. The patient is usually uh, intubated with double lumen intubation to control for respiration, to control for hemorrhage, if, if that occurs during the intubation and, and during the procedure. Uh, then we position the patient like we would for a lung biopsy with the best approach um, for the probe, avoiding fissures, avoiding major vessels and so on. 
the patient, in addition to the general anesthesia, receives local anesthesia because that will avoid reflexes if the general anesthesia is not um, deep enough. You may or may not perform a biopsy prior to the micro microwave ablation to get new histology or to confirm histology. And then the proplacement is performed and ablation is done according to the um, size of necrosis we want to achieve, including a safety margin of at least five millimeters. And as mentioned before, we need track ablation to avoid tumor cell seeding and hemorrhage. The patient is then placed in a recovery room under supervision from anesthetist for four hours. And if the patient is stable, we obtain a supine chest radiograph after four hours to exclude major um, pneumothorax, major um, hemothorax or hemorrhage into the lung. If that's normal, the patient uh, goes to a peripheral ward and is usually discharged the next day. Uh, but we'd love to uh, obtain a follow-up scan before discharge to check for immediate complications and uh, get uh, an idea of the uh, therapy effect. And then we would follow the patient with CT every, four, every three months. Complications, most of them are similar to lung biopsy. So pneumothorax, which we, I think, should treat uh, as radiologists, hemorrhage, and uh, other than in biopsy infection, because we create a large area of necrosis and we tell every patient if they develop fever of un unexplained origin, uh, they should come back uh, because the necrosis uh, might have become infected. And we also do periprocedural uh, and uh, intravenous antibiotic therapy to prevent that. Uh, follow up, as I said, on the next day to rule out complications and to assess the uh, technical su success. And later, we do follow up after three, six, sometimes nine and 12 months and so on to exclude recurrence. The problem with follow up to exclude recurrence is that every individual pulmonary lesion after microwave ablation looks larger than before. So it takes long to make sure that there is no recurrence. That's one of the disadvantages. Now I've got a few cases for you. This is a patient with uh, renal cell carcinoma who had undergone resection of pulmonary metastasis in his left lung with some loss of parenchyma. And when he developed this then solitary right lung metastasis, the MDT uh, decision was to go for microwave ablation. This is the probe placement and you can see that it was possible to penetrate this relatively small uh, metastasis. Um, and the, so we were able to work with one probe position. This is the follow-up scan the next day, and that's what you really want to see, because you can uh, even see the former needle track. You can still see the lesion. The area of ground glass is the area you've treated that will go necrotic later on, and this is the uh, rim of the necrosis you have created. So this is a very good um, imaging uh, confirmation of a technically successful case. This is another case with metastatic chondrosarcoma who had undergone bilateral pulmonary metastasectomy, and you can see the many scars in both lungs. And when the patient developed this uh, new nodule, uh, which we were quite certain from the follow-up that this was a new metastasis, again, the MDT decision was to treat with microwave ablation. This is the process of placing the microwave probe, and the actual lesion is here, so we again were able to just go through the lesion, and you always need to go through the lesion because there's very little heat in front of the probe. So uh, the probe needs to be um, uh, distal to the lesion if you want to have a safety margin. This is uh, the rim of consolidation at the end of the um, treatment, and you can see the needle, the probe track after removal of the needle. This is again the metastasis before. And on the day after treatment, very similar to the case I just showed, this is six weeks. So if somebody is not aware of the fact what mi microwave ablation does, people would probably say there's a massive increase in size of that nodule. So a patient is progressing. And that's an important message. It's always bigger, much bigger after a therapy than before. And only if you wait for months, uh, the scar goes back to a, a linear structure and it ne usually never goes back completely to normal. 
He has a complicated case who had uh, es esophageal cancer, was treated with radiochemotherapy for the primary tumor and then developed pulmonary nodules and we obtained a biopsy confirming multiple pulmonary metastasis. The patient underwent chemotherapy and all of the nodules disappeared. Biopsy confirmed metastasis as I said and then three nodules reappeared, one in the left uh, upper lobe and two in the right. And again the MDT decision was to go for microwave ablation because uh, the patient obviously had had irradiation to the chest and the irradi radiation oncologist felt it problematic to give more radiation. Surgery was uh, not indicated in this patient with metastatic disease, so we went for microwave and in this case you can see that it was not possible to penetrate the lesion, but we uh, placed the probe on either side of the lesion and by the way you can see the double lumen uh, intubation here. Immediately after the procedure again there is a big area of consolidation masking uh, the metastasis. In the next session, we treated two lesions in the right apex. Here is one, which is just seen here, and this is the second. Again, pro placement on either side of both lesions. And again, the next, no, the same day, you can see the needle tract and one of the lesions here surrounded by an area of ground glass and consolidation. And again, it takes uh, quite some time uh, to see, if you look at this case here, to see how, uh, how long it takes for the lesion to at least go down to the initial size and it takes much longer uh, to actually confirm that there's no local recurrence. And here's a final case uh, of a patient who had had an old patient, 82 years, who had had small cell lung cancer, stage 3A, treated with chemo radiation. He went into complete remission and after 12 months, this nodule appeared, with, which three months later uh, had grown. And again, the MDT decision was not to operate on that patient because of the uh, recent small cell disease, but to treat the patient with um, microwave ablation. We were not sure whether it was a metastasis or a second lung primary. The growth pattern uh, was more uh, suggestive of non-small cell lung cancer in this heavy smoker. Uh, we were able to penetrate the lesion again with a probe. We induced a pneumothorax, and this is the message which I think is important. If, as a radiologist, we create a complication, we should ideally be able to treat it ourselves. So the patient, after successful therapy of that uh, lesion, was turned in the supine position. We put a simple cannula in to aspirate uh, the pneumothorax, which we did until it was completely gone. No catheter placed, just aspiration with the needle. And this is the follow-up the next day, which shows th two things. First of all, there's the lesion completely surrounded by the ablation zone. And secondly, the pneumothorax did not reoccur. So it's a very good technique of simple aspiration of pneumothorax. In our experience, in post-biopsy or post-ablation pneumothorax, in 80% of the cases, aspiration is enough without catheter placement. This is the further follow-up after three months, and you can again see that the lesion is still larger than the initial lesion. With these cases, I'd like to conclude and come to my take-home points. As I said, I think an MDT decision is uh, man mandatory, basically, to, to make the indication for microwave as opposed to surgery or radiation oncology. If there, the decision is made, it's in fast and easy technique similar to a lung biopsy. The result is really predictable other than uh, RFA um, and I have no experience with other ablation techniques. The problem is confirmation of complete ablation because imaging will provide the confirmation only after very many months or sometimes years. The advantage is that we cause little loss of parenchyma and this is the reason why it is repeatable. So if the patient develops another metastasis or a local recurrence, we can still repeat the procedure. That's all, and I thank for your attention.